Jesus, um, uh, Matthew 26, 36 through 46, Jesus prays in Gethsemane. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Then in Matthew 27, 15 through 31, Jesus delivered to be crucified. Now, at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now, the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, let him be crucified. And he said, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. So, when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then... The soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole battalion before him and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the road, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to crucify him. And stand and sing another song. Feet. 
from Luke 23, starting in verse 26. And as they led him away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene, who was a monk coming from the country, and laid on him the cross to carry behind Jesus. And there followed him a great multitude of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. But turning to them, Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, 
what will happen when it is dry? Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by, watching. But the ruler scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? We indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour. And there was darkness over the whole land unto the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said that, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for the spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> you get away for one Sunday and you forget all about what you're supposed to do. But um, I would like you to just take your Bibles first. We're going to look at two other passages, but I would like you to turn to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke in chapter 22. That's where we'll begin our reflections tonight. Um, it's my habit, I'm sure for many of you it's a habit as well, during the uh, Holy Week to spend some time meditating on the events that occurred around the death and the burial and then the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And every year when I do that, I mean, it's the same material. It's the same thing that we've looked at year after year and time after time. But every year, it seems like when I take that concentrated effort to really focus in on the story, God seems to focus my attention in different places. And this year was no different from the previous years. And so, especially while meditating on Luke and the gospel account from Luke's perspective, I was struck by something that I hadn't seen before. I mean, I've seen it, but not quite the way that I saw it this time. Luke presents his material in just a little bit different form. And, And so... Um, I want to begin there, and I, I just couldn't stop thinking as I read through the, the account of Luke, and in particular, uh, Luke 22, I couldn't help but keep thinking about the intense spiritual battle that was taking place. Now, I, I mean, we know that Jesus went through a lot, and that's, that's, we've read some of those passages, and just thinking about some of the things that he went through, it, it's, it's so... It's so uh, unbelievable to think about what he must have gone through and some of the pain and the anguish. And, and then, then as we look at that, those moments in the garden when he's praying, um, we, we, we get that Christ was in, a, in an intense spiritual battle. I mean, to have the account given where he's sweating drops of blood, that, that's just unthinkable to me. Now, I'm sweating tonight because I think it's really hot in here, okay? 
<laughs> but some of us are happy about that. But nonetheless, I can't imagine sweating so much you sweat blood drops. So we know that. But I think what I've missed over the years is the intense spiritual battle that the disciples were also in. And that's what I want us to consider tonight. Um, because we are also in an intense spiritual battle. And like the disciples, I don't think we're often aware of it. And yet we see the spiritual wreckage all around us. We, 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 we see it. Sometimes we experience it ourselves. But we don't stop and think about the intense battle, spiritual battle that we're in. And I was struck when I read the, this, this, these passages. I was struck by the stark contrast behind, between how Jesus handled this spiritual battle and how the disciples did. And I think when we examine it this evening in just the short time that we have, we will be able to see that contrast. And I think if we're honest, we're going to be sad in some ways to think how often we, I, approach our daily spiritual battles in the same way those disciples did over 2,000 years ago. And I think in that, there is a lesson for us to learn tonight, a lesson that comes from that garden experience. You see, the events of Good Friday, I think, really present to us a vivid picture of the spiritual battle that really rages around us even today. And I think it gives us clues on how we should approach it on a daily basis. And so I want to look at the three of these accounts. We're going to look at Matthew uh, 26. We'll look at Luke 22. That's where we'll start. And then we'll finish with John 19, which is my favorite account of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ because of the uh, words that are found there. But I want to look at and consider how Jesus is a model for how we should approach the spiritual battle that we're in. And then I want us to highlight some of the pitfalls that the disciples show us, okay? So let's read. We'll just, you follow along as I read Luke chapter uh, 22, uh, verse 39 through 46, okay? Luke chapter 22, verse 39. And this is, the events have all been taking place. Jesus is now finding himself in the garden. And it says this, and he came out and went as was his custom to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. Right there's our first clue, that there's an intense spiritual battle that the disciples are in that they may not be completely aware of, okay? Then it goes on and says, and he withdrew him from him, withdrew from them, about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and he prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven and strengthening him, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and he found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Now that's an abbreviated of what we find in some other places. But I want you to see this picture of the spiritual battle that Luke paints for us that's a little different than the other accounts. What we don't see in the other accounts that we do see in Luke is this, this account begins with Jesus saying, pray lest you fall into temptation. And it ends with Jesus saying, pray lest you fall into temptation. These are bookends to the spiritual battle picture that we see of Jesus, where Jesus prays earnestly and often and with, with, with great passion. But what do we find the disciples? They pray, but they are found, what? Sleeping. And so we see this, 
the structure that Luke presents to us, the disciples, Jesus warned. Now, keep in mind, Jesus had already warned uh, Peter, hey, be careful. It, it, your time is coming for a great spiritual battle, but they're approaching it just like every other day or night. And so this structure is here. You see, what they lacked in understanding, I think, especially in, on this particular night, perhaps they weren't aware of all the dynamics that were going around, but Jesus had been telling them all along the way that this is going to happen. I mean, they, they should have known, but like we, we sometimes don't really pay attention. And they got caught and we see Jesus is successfully going through this spiritual battle and the disciples failing miserably because they were not prepared for what they're up against. And here's what I think we need to grab a hold of, this one truth, as we look at this passage in particular. Prayer is an essential part of our fortification for the spiritual battle. Remember what Jesus said, pray lest you fall into temptation. Prayer is an essential part of that battle that we are in each and every day. And the lack thereof will lead to the inevitable defeat that we see of the disciples. And so as we reflect on all that Jesus did for us over 2,000 years ago, and we concentrate on the spiritual battle that is going all around them, remember, prayer is essential to our spiritual fortification. Then I want you to look in Matthew chapter 26 briefly. Matthew 26, it's a same account, but a lot more uh, detail is given. And I'm not going to take the time to read all of this passage, but from verse 33 down through verse 75, there are really three pitfalls that we see for the spiritual battle that we're all in. Three things that we need to be warned against, three things that we need to be on guard for, three things that if we're not careful, if we're not being diligent in prayer, these temptations will overtake us. I think that's what this story tells us. And the first one is found in the life of Peter and the lack of self-awareness. You see, I think Peter was one of those guys that always kind of jumped up and wanted to declare that he was all in. You remember what Jesus said? Jesus comes to wash his feet, and Peter says, no, 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 you can't wash my feet. And then when Jesus gave him a little spiritual lesson, he said, well, then wash all of me. Well, then when it came time to Jesus talk about being betrayed, when he said this night, Peter, what did Peter say? Oh, no, oh, no, not me. Nope. I got my sword. I will take care of you, Jesus. Everybody else, but I. Peter was that kind of a guy. Now, I appreciate his passion. I appreciate his desire. And before we stomp on Peter's reputation too harshly, he was the only disciple that really followed after Jesus, even though he kind of hid in the darkness. But... There was a lack of self-awareness. You see, Peter was warned, Satan wants to sift you like wheat. And Peter says, oh, no, not me. That's the issue, I think, the pitfall that we need to be aware of when we go into spiritual battle. See, if, if we elevate our view of ourselves, we deny what Scripture says, that we have to live completely and totally dependent upon God. We have to walk in the Spirit. If we're not walking in the Spirit, we will fulfill the lust of the flesh. The Bible is full of that command to us. The Bible tells us not to think more highly of ourselves, but to think soberly, understanding our weakness, understanding the tendency to have a lack of self-awareness, much like Peter. That's, so that's pitfall number one that this story provides for us. The other thing is in the three accounts that we have presented in Matthew 26, uh, you know, Luke and his tourniquet uh, version of it only provides us with two really accounts. But in Matthew 26, three times Jesus comes back. Three times he tells them to pray. He goes away. He prays by himself. And he comes back and he finds his disciples sleeping. Three times Jesus expresses his disappointment that they could not just wait and watch and pray with him. Jesus understood the significance of the battle that he was in. Jesus understood the enormity of the moment. The disciples were sleeping. Now, 
again, we all need our rest. There's no doubt. But I think this is a picture of where we far too often become guilty of this particular pitfall, where we're more concerned about our comfort than we are about the sacrifice that is needed to battle on. Jesus in his darkest moment, with those who, surrounded by those who were closest to him, all he asked them to do is just watch and pray with me. Just stay awake and pray. And they fell asleep. Comfort becomes a pitfall in this spiritual battle. The third pitfall that I see in Matthew 26 here is, is really, again, in the life of Peter. And it's the fear of man. And when we look at um, verse 56, um, everybody else left and fled. Peter hides in the shadows. And then we have this account in chapter 26, verses 69 and following. Listen to these words. It says, now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. At least he's there. Nobody else is there, but he's there. He's hiding. But he's, this isn't one of his shining moments. So he's sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came up to him and said, you also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. And when he went out of the, to the entrance, another servant girl saw him and said to the bystanders, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know this man. And after a little while, the bystanders came to him up and said to him, Peter, certainly you too, certainly you too were with him. You were one of them. Your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on them and to swear, I do not know the man. The fear of man. And I think that's a pitfall we have in the spiritual battle that we're in. We live in a day and age where we're called to declare the gospel to a lost and dying world, a world that no longer wants to hear, repent and be saved. We live in a culture that does not want to have that said, does not want to be pointing to the fact that they need a savior. And we sit sometimes far too quiet. You see, a key to understanding our victorious Christian living is understanding that we are vulnerable and desperately need God to strengthen us. But the good news tonight that we celebrate, and we will celebrate it in fullness on Sunday, but it was already declared on the Friday. It's in John chapter 19. This is where we have the ultimate declaration of victory. In John chapter 19, verse 30, when Jesus said this, and when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. The Greek word, to telestai. It's a perfect passive participle. Means that this has been established before the foundation of the world. Christ was crucified in God's plan. This is now being carried out now. And it will have lasting effect all the way into future eternity. It is done. God planned it and made sure it would happen in the past. Jesus came and accomplished it in the present. And it's guaranteed in the future. It is finished. So we may have the pitfalls and we may struggle. We're in a spiritual battle, but here's the good news. This is why Good Friday is good, because Christ won the victory. And therefore, we can be secure. You see, Christ has secured the victory for us. We're not fighting for victory. We're fighting from victory. We're fighting nonetheless. We're in a spiritual battle, but we're not fighting for the victory we're fighting from victory. And Good Friday's challenge is whether or not we will live out that victory in daily lives. That's the challenge of tonight. And so we're in just a moment. We're going to allow you to go to these four tables at your, at your discretion and, and partake in the communion. 
And as we always do, we warn you, if, you're, if your life isn't right, take some time. There's going to be a beautiful song that's going to be sung by our ladies. I hope you listen to the words and listen carefully. Reflect on that. Reflect on what God has done for us and the victory that has been won, that it is finished. And then when you're ready, after you've spent time in prayer and seeking God, preparing your heart, go over together as a family or as a couple or as an individual, with friends, whatever. Go over and partake. And then we'll close our night with a song that we sing together. But let's just pray and ask God to bless these elements that we have. And, and seek his face. Father, we, again, are overwhelmed by the passages that we see and read. We're overwhelmed by all that you have said and done and accomplished, what Jesus did so many years ago. And for that, we give you thanks. We give you thanks that he became a man as represented in the bread. We give you thanks that he shed his blood, which is represented in the cup. And he did it for us. But he also did it for your glory. And that sacrifice demands that we live for your glory as well. So God, do that work in our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.